Paul Watson, bonjour. Bonjour. Nous vous recevons pour une chaîne YouTube et une communauté Internet qui s'appelle Thinkerview et Monsieur Mondialisation. Nous avons des questions à vous poser concernant euh, votre activité, votre euh, cheval de bataille. Qu'est-ce que vous pouvez nous en dire I established the Sea Shepherd Conservation Society in 1977 as an organization to intervene against uh, poaching, against illegal activities uh, on the high seas. So we're really an anti-poaching organization. And we intervene globally, and we do so with what I call aggressive nonviolence. What is uh, aggressive nonviolence? Well, we're aggressive, but we never injure anybody. And in our entire 40-year experience, uh, we've never caused a single injury to any person at all. But we have shut down numerous poaching operations from you know, overfishing, uh, whaling, uh, shark killing, uh, turtle killing. Uh, we've shut these things down through aggressive intervention, but at the same time being very careful not to injure anybody. How do you imagine the, the ocean's future? From your point of view, will it be better or on the contrary, worse? Well, the future of the ocean is what we're seeing right now, which is a uh, Um, an escalating diminishment of uh, biodiversity. We've lost 90% of the fishes over the last 100 years. We've had a 40% diminishment in phytoplankton population since 1950. So there's some very serious situations that have been happening as far as a diminishment of biodiversity. The problem is, is most people are unaware of that. Uh, by 2048, according to Dr. Boris Worm of Dalhousie University and Dr. Daniel Pauly of the University of British Columbia, who are the two foremost oceanographic fishery scientists, uh, there won't be any fishing industry in, 19, in 2048 because there won't be any fish. Uh, there won't be any coral reefs. Uh, so what we're looking at is, a, is an ecological disaster within our oceans. And uh, that doesn't bode well for the future of humanity. Because as I always say, if the ocean dies, we die. We don't live on this planet with a dead ocean. And as the ocean is diminished, our ability to survive is diminished. But at the same time today, it seems that despite your fight, the humanity does not measure the impact of losing biodiversity in oceans. So concretely, when are things going to change and how could it change? For hundreds of years now, uh, well, for millions of years, the, uh, the ocean has been the life support system of the, of the planet. If you look at the Earth as a, as a spaceship, which is traveling through space, which is what it is, every spaceship has a life support system. And it provides the food we eat, it regulates the temperature, controls the climate, and it provides the uh, air that we breathe. And that life support system is to be found in the ocean. And that life support system is run by a crew, a crew of uh, on this planet, which are are all these various species that make it work. We're not crew, we're passengers. We're having a great time entertaining ourselves. But what we're doing is killing off the crew, the phytoplankton that produces the oxygen, the whales that uh, uh, provide the nutrients for the phytoplankton, the, uh, the interrelationship with all the species that keeps everything running and has kept everything running for millions of years. We're seriously compromising the efficiency of that, what, if you look at it in terms of machinery, that life support system. And that's a very serious uh, situation. 40% diminishment in phytoplankton population since 1950 is a serious situation that really nobody's aware of. Uh, phytoplankton provides between uh, 50 and 70 or possibly even 80% of all of the oxygen that we breathe, the rest coming from trees and plants. And if you remove phytoplankton, which is now seriously being depleted, then we simply will not have oxygen to breathe. And uh, the relationship between phytoplankton and whales is that whales provide the nutrients for the phytoplankton iron and nitrogen primarily uh, through the feces, similar to horse manure on uh, uh, providing fertilizer on a farm. So the, whalers, the whales are in fact uh, 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 the farmers of the ocean. But we don't, you know, we're not intelligent enough to really understand all of those interrelationships and the, and the interdependence of all of those species. And uh, as such, we're depleting that ability of the oceanic ecosystems to sustain life on this planet. I'm sure You heard about the COP21, the Conference of Parties in Paris. At the end of the media event, the former president of the COP, Laurent Fabius, talked about a historic agreement. Now, we're six months later, what is your feeling about these agreements? And do you think the conference pushed people and companies to realize the emergency of the situation? Well, COP21 uh, was a nothing event. Uh, Nothing came out of it. It was a great opportunity for all the world leaders to pat themselves on the back and do photo opportunities about how they're going to save the planet, but they didn't discuss anything of, uh, of any relevance. Um, I presented a booklet on uh, solutions to climate change that nobody wants to hear, and 
They certainly didn't want to hear it and they certainly didn't discuss it. And the fact is that if we want to protect uh, this planet from the consequences of climate change, and one, we have to allow the ocean to repair itself. That means we have to stop all industrialized fishing operations. We have to stop subsidies on industrialized fishing operations. You know, it takes time. And if, unless we're willing to do that, the oceans are going to die. Uh, another solution to that is that we have to switch to plant-based diets because we're killing 65 billion animals every year, and that's not counting the ones that we take out of the ocean. And uh, the animal husbandry industry contributes more greenhouse gases to uh, the atmosphere than the entire transportation industry. And also consumes more water, creates dead zones, and is uh, one of the most serious causes of pollution, both in groundwater and in the ocean. And uh, so, But nobody really wants to address those solutions. They want to find um, uh, answers that are for, you know, that are acceptable, that don't affect our lifestyle. And at the same time, governments want to find uh, solutions through taxation. They figure that this is a good opportunity to tax everybody in order to bring that money. But as I found on environmental taxes uh, throughout the world, is that when they're collected, they don't go towards solving the problem. They basically go to what governments usually spend their money on, which is wasting it on ridiculous things, like defense or uh, subsidies or, um, or their own payrolls. From your point of view, is France involved on green issues or completely blind? Well, France is no different than any other country, which means that France, like all these other countries, is doing nothing to address the real uh, problems. Uh, you know, there's a pretense that there's things being done, but just on the oceans, for example, France controls uh, the second largest maritime territory on the planet. Uh, the French Navy is in a wonderful opportunity to enforce illegal, uh, against illegal fishing operations but they don't do very much. And I, I've actually spoken to the Admiral of the French Navy the, uh, about this, and he agrees. Uh, but he said that their hands are tied politically. What, uh, what is your feeling about uh, Nicolas Hulot? I think Nicolas Hulot is, uh, is certainly, you know, he when he was putting together the COP21, I think he came to realize that it wasn't going to, uh, it wasn't going to achieve what he hoped it would achieve, and I think he was quite disappointed about this. Uh, I think he's probably the, uh, the only one who's in sort of a political position in France to, who's actually sincerely wants to find an answer. Your organization, Sea Shepherd, suffered some criticism. For instance, some people pointed out your lack of tolerance towards poor population activities. For example, you made a campaign in La Réunion to protect sharks. And in fact, the local population was puzzled because it was a question of dozens of sharks, while French vessels fish thousands of tons of sharks every year and there is no campaign there. So... Do you accept and understand these criticisms? Uh, first, on the first question, uh, we don't target uh, anybody who doesn't act illegally. So I don't really care if people are rich or poor. If they're breaking the law, we're going to oppose them. But we're, what we're primarily doing is uh, going against large corporate fishing operations. I mean, we're talking about multi-million dollar corporations that are, are, are literally looting the oceans. Right now, we have one of our vessels working in a partnership with the government of Gabon to stop uh, illegal fishing in Gabonese waters. Last week, we arrested three Chinese vessels that were operating that water illegally. Uh, last month, we chased uh, six uh, illegal Japanese, uh, Chinese actually, Chinese drift netters all the way from the Indian Ocean back to China and turned them over to the Chinese government with the evidence of illegal activity. Uh, we're working in partnership with the Mexican Navy to save the endangered Bakita. And uh, yes, those are poor fishermen who are going after this uh, Bakita, but they're doing it illegally. So we seized 20, uh, 25 long lines and about uh, 42 illegally set gill nets, and we confiscated those. Uh, you know, you, you can't use uh, poverty as an excuse for this kind of law-breaking. Otherwise, it would be certainly uh, quite all right for people to sell cocaine because they're poor. It's certainly all right to rob banks because they're poor. Uh, so if you look at the ocean as a bank that contains the, uh, the savings or the investment for the future of all humanity, then the poachers are no different than bank robbers. Oh, and then on the question of La Reunion. Uh, there are, th you know, every year, uh, the average number of people killed by sharks is seven which is amazing when you consider that every day about 300 million people go into the ocean. 
So, uh, you know, your chances of getting killed by a shark are pretty, pretty small. In fact, it's more dangerous to play golf. If you're out golfing, your chances of being struck by lightning or being stung by a bee and dying are greater, and more people die on golf courses every year than are attacked by sharks. We need sharks. They have shaped evolution in our ocean for 450 million years. They are an apex predator, and they're essential for the ecological integrity of the ocean. Therefore, there is no excuse for killing them. The problem is, is the three places in the world where shark attacks are more prevalent are Queensland, Western Australia, and La Reunion Island. And what do those three places have in common? They have shark kill programs. That is, they're culling sharks and funded by the government to do that. Now, what does that do? Sharks are territorial creatures. Therefore, when you go in and you kill sharks in an area, you create a vacuum which draws more sharks into that area. And those sharks are by nature territorial, and become very aggressive as a jockey per position within that territory. Therefore, those programs in La Reunion, Queensland, and Western Australia are creating aggressive sharks. And therefore, the responsibility for the shark attacks now becomes the people who are killing the sharks. The government of France, in fact, is contributing to those shark attacks. And uh, as for the surfers who complain about this, on our advisory board, we are fortunate to have Kelly Slater, who's the probably the foremost surfer in the world. And I think Kelly's advice to the surfers at La Reunion was quite appropriate. He said, uh, if you're afraid of sharks, then stay out of the ocean. You don't belong there. Do you think Greenpeace has enough power to influence political decision in Australia? Greenpeace is a business, just like the World Wildlife Fund is. Um, they're there to sell feel-good feelings. Join Greenpeace, you're part of the solution. You're not part of the problem. <laughs> Last year, Greenpeace brought in 375 million euros. They spent 170 million euros to get that money. It's an investment for a return. Um, you know, they had three ships that do very little. Last year, Sea Shepherd brought in 12 million euros. We have nine ships out there all the time. And uh, so we're doing more on less because we realized a long time ago that money is not the solution. It's the passion, the imagination, and the courage of the volunteers who are involved. So we spend nothing on raising money. And the monies that we do bring in, we spend on programs and we accomplish more. It is known that you're not on the same page with Greenpeace, but some of your supporters are both following Greenpeace and you. They perhaps think you're complementary. So could you imagine a partnership or will you always fight each other? Well, first of all, we don't fight Greenpeace, but we do fight attitudes. When Greenpeace supports the seal hunt, we oppose it. When Greenpeace supports whaling, we oppose them. When Greenpeace supports the killing of polar bears, we oppose them. Uh, they're not on the same side. If you support the commercial killing of seals, you're not on our side. And uh, so therefore, we're going to challenge that. So I'm not challenging Greenpeace on the basis of being Greenpeace. I'm challenging them on the positions that, that, that they're holding, which we're against. That also holds true to the World Wildlife Fund. We work primarily with grassroots organizations around the world. That's where the strength of the environmental conservation movement lies in that kind of diversity. You know, there are about three million non-government uh, environmental organizations registered throughout the world, and that is the strength of the entire movement. Not the big organizations, but all of these small organizations, they're the ones that are making the difference. They're not the ones with the money, they're the ones with the passion, and those are the ones that we, we work in alliance with. What is your feeling about the young generation? Do you think they care about the situation, that they understand, or on the contrary, that they gave up? Well, there's a lot of all of that. Uh, younger people are certainly far more aware today than, than 20, 30, 40 years ago. I mean, back in 1972, nobody even knew what the word ecology meant. Uh, and certainly people were blind to the real problems. So I think young people are far more aware now. Uh, are they involved? Yes, people are distracted by everything from video games to entertainment or whatever. But I do see a level of involvement probably greater than any time in previous history. And uh, young people actually face a very uh, uh, daunting challenge that uh, other generations before them didn't have to deal with. And that challenge is the fact that this might not be a livable planet at the end of this century, and that's going to severely affect uh, you know, their life. So uh, the, the, the obstacles are very real, and sometimes they're quite overwhelming. I happen to believe that uh, when you face an impossible situation and overwhelming odds, you have to find impossible solutions. And I believe those solutions can be found, again, through imagination, passion, and courage. And I'm seeing more and more of that in, in young people. 
Uh, we have nine ships. On those ships right now, we have about 125 volunteers from 20 or 25 different nations. It, it all depends. And so we have thousands of people who want to participate. So there's certainly, I'm seeing the passion of people who, wanting to, who want to get involved. And they want to get involved because when they join our vessels, they can actually get the satisfaction of seeing results for their efforts. They go down, they shut down an illegal fishing operation, or they save X number of whales, or they save X number of turtles on the beaches in, say, Costa Rica. Uh, these are real results, and therefore it gives people not only the satisfaction of doing it, but also the encouragement that they can do more. Because I believe that uh, everybody has the, um, the ability to, to change things, to change the world, and that we encourage that individual initiative, that individual, uh, an individual imagination to find those solutions. Do people on board pay for it? No, 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 no. no. Uh, they come on board. They're provided with a uh, room and board, and uh, there's they don't have to pay to join. No, the only payment, I guess, is whatever their air ticket is to to join the the ship wherever it is in the world. If it's in Australia, they have to fly to Australia. If it's in Africa, they have to fly to Africa. But there's actually no um, cost involved. In fact, we don't even have a membership within Sea Shepherd. It's um, we have supporters, but we don't have a set membership. Which could be your advice for the young generation? Well, my advice is really for people to follow their passions and to, uh, you know, if they're interested in something, to, to pursue it. Uh, you know, I find that one person championing one cause makes a difference. Uh, because of uh, Diane Fossey, mountain gorillas are survived in Rwanda. Uh, the work of Jane Goodall and Bruti Geltikos when she's protecting orangutans uh, in Indonesia. Uh, these are examples of individuals who make a difference because of their passion. Uh, one man in um, Bermuda, David Wingate, because of him, the Bermuda Storm Petrel didn't go extinct. I mean, I can't think of anything more, uh, n you know, a greater legacy to leave than the fact that you lived in an entire species was uh, prevented from going extinct. And so I encourage people all over the world when they come to me and they say, well, I'm really concerned about, you know, say, protecting jaguars in, uh, in Belize. I said, well, then, then do that. You, you know, do whatever you can. Use your imagination and, and, and find ways to get involved and do things like that. So this is what we try to do is encourage people to follow their own passions. Soon there will be a presidential election in the U.S. Uh, for you, who could be the best candidate to defend green issues? <laughs> There isn't one. There isn't one. That's like trying to choose between, you know, uh, cholera and smallpox, really. Uh, <laughs> there is no best kind of candidate. Who could be the worst? The worst? Oh, well, you got a choice between an idiot, Donald Trump, or a psychopath like Hillary Clinton. I mean, that's basically your choice. Uh, you, the problem is that the United States is not a democracy. It's an oligarchy, and they already choose the president before anybody, get, anybody gets to vote. I personally was backing Bernie Sanders, and I believe that he, he would have won if they didn't rig the election against him. And also the media refused to cover them because the media is controlled by the same people who control the corporations who decide who's going to be president. And uh, so you're not going to really get any democratic uh, representation in a country where the corporations have the final say. And that's pretty much true of everything. For instance, um, Justin Trudeau came to uh, P uh, Paris one month after being elected as prime minister. Justin of Trudeau from Canada? Yeah. One month after being elected as prime minister of Canada, he came to Paris. And he was all gung-ho. He's going to really do something about climate change. I mean, he's very idealistic, and he brought in about 150 people with him, and they all sat down, and they were very, very serious, and then he went home. But he had only been prime minister for a month. So when he went home, the people who really control things must have sat him down and talked to him, because now he's, su he's supporting the pipeline. He's supporting the tar sands project. He's uh, saying that the fires that they had in Alberta are not connected with climate change. So he's becoming like everybody else. It's basically because they're just puppets who are told what to do. They're not, we don't have any world leaders. We basically have puppets controlled by the corporations who actually control everything. The mining companies, the logging companies, the big fishing companies, the nuclear power countries. They're the ones that control everything. And the, the, this so-called voting is just, is just a charade. You're not gonna, that's why we never get anybody who actually does anything. There is a report, a petition on the internet against you because you have Brigitte Bardot as a Facebook friend. What do you answer to them? I don't, I don't have any politics. I'm neither right nor left. I actually find it quite funny that the, the right accuses me of being a leftist. The, leftist, the left accuses me of being right wing. Uh, I don't have politics. I believe that the protection of our ocean 
is what everyone has in common, regardless of your religion, regardless of your politics, regardless of who or where you are. We all have that common interest that we have to protect uh, our ocean. So I'm not really concerned about uh, these anthropocentric concepts, which, uh, you know, which is what politics and religion are all about. They're anthropocentric concepts. What we've done over the last few thousand years is set up this uh, system where we have declared ourselves to be the supreme beings, almost like gods in our own minds, and that nothing else matters. We're in charge of everything. We're in more important than everything. I don't believe that. We're not more important than anything. In fact, worms and trees and bees are more important than we are because they can live without us. We can't live without them. That makes them more important than we are. So I don't get involved with politics. All I do know if, with Bridget Bardot is that for three years, we were trying to make the world pay attention to the slaughter of seals in eastern Canada. Nobody paid attention. And that's when I learned a lesson. If you want to get people's attention, you have to play the rule by the rules that the media sets. And the media only understands four things, sex, scandal, violence, and celebrity. So if you want a story, you have to incorporate those elements into the story. So Is when this I, why some people say you are sexist? Well, personally, I don't really care what they think. I'm not here to cater to them. My clients are whales and turtles and seals and sharks and birds. And I couldn't give a shit about what people think about me. I'm not here representing them. Do you trust people? No, I don't, not at all. Uh, but the thing is, is that... When Tell I, me why. Well, first of all, let me just finish what I was saying about Bridget. Sorry about that. By bringing her out to the ice, we guaranteed coverage around the world. Her picture appeared on every magazine, and we accomplished more with her one visit to the ice than we had accomplished in three years of doing our activism. So that's when I realized that we have to incorporate celebrities because they are media. Uh, It's a kind of hacking. It's a kind of hack. You know what's a hacker? Hacker? Yeah. I guess you could say it. It's kind it's of a, a kind hack. of media hack. Kind of like media hacking, I suppose. Uh, you know, six months ago, I wrote a speech to be delivered to the Russian government. They're not going to listen to me. <laughs> But what I wanted to do was to get them to stop whale meat transportations through uh, the Arctic, through their waters. So I wrote the speech. I had Pamela Anderson go to Russia and deliver the speech. They not only listened to it, they gave her a standing ovation and they acted on what we asked them to do. Why? Because Pamela Anderson is a form of media. And uh, so we use celebrities, and they allow themselves to be used as a form of media. So that's why we, uh, we deal with them. And I'm really not interested in what the politics of those celebrities are. I'm interested in the fact that they are, just like a television station or a newspaper, a means of delivering a message. What is your opinion about Putin? He's just like another world leader. I don't have any... Is he a puppet? They're, well, they're all puppets of others, you know. Uh, Putin's probably less of a pup puppet based on, you know, the fact that he's a dictator in of, of himself. But who knows who's pulling the strings there? I don't know. Uh, I do know that uh, no real change comes through politics, whether whatever that system of government is. Uh, they are all indebted to um, the economic status quo. They're all into short-term investment for short-term gain. Uh, without very, I don't, I, I can't think of a single political leader in the world who looks forward a hundred years from now and says, "What's this world going to be like because of what we're doing right now?" I don't know a single one of them that's doing that. What is your opinion about the no growing? Well, you know, no species has ever survived on this planet outside of the three basic laws of ecology. The first is the law of diversity. The strength of an ecosystem is with diversity within it. The second is the law of interdependence. That the species within that ecosystem are dependent upon each other. And the third is the law of finite resources. There's a limit to growth, a limit to uh, carrying capacity. What we humans are doing right now is stealing the carrying capacity of other species. They have to disappear to make room for more and more of us. But what that does is diminish interdependence and diversity, which can l lead to a collapse of the entire system. If, and if it it's happen, if, if we're going to live a collapse, what's going on? What's, what will happen? What will happen in a collapse? Yeah, yeah. Civilization will cease to exist. We may go extinct. It's uh, quite simple uh, because uh, we cannot survive without oxygen. We cannot survive without food. And we cannot survive without runaway, it was run, runaway climate change. So we, we don't survive. That's really what the final consequences are. The only way we're going to survive is to learn to live in harmony with all the other citizen species on this planet. We, all, we have to uh, appreciate and understand the role that they play, the role that whales play, the role that fish play, the role that birds play. They all contribute to this 
life support system. We can't continue to act like we're the only species that matter. What could you tell us about the Kuster team? Let's start with the captain and that what about the youngest team? I knew Jacques Cousteau. I met him on many occasions. And uh, I think that he was a man ahead of his time. He certainly uh, contributed a great deal to the worldwide education on uh, on marine uh, ecosystems. Uh, So as an educator, he was quite, uh, he he really contributed a great deal. And the youngest team? Well, I don't get along with Jean-Michel Cousteau, but uh, with, the, uh, with the kids, uh, you know, the grandkids and everything, I get along quite well with uh, and have uh, worked with them and have spoken with them. And I think that, you know, it's a, it's a family that is symbolic of, uh, of oceanic awareness, and I'm really happy to see that uh, they're involved. You know, the whole family is involved in one way or the other, and they do make a contribution. I, I like them. Have you seen the so-called the seventh continent or Great Pacific Garbage Patch? I know what you're talking about. I, I uh, we've had a plastic campaign now for years. It's called the Vortex Project. The and, Vortex. Exactly. And what we do is we have beach cleanups around the world. Uh, we collect tons and tons of plastic from around the world and send that in for recycling. We ship it off to a central place to be recycled. Uh, last year we brought in 72 kilometers, 70 tons of of gill net from the Southern Ocean and had that turned into shoes. Um, so we're we're also looking for alternatives to plastic. Uh, right now, we have a project to find alternatives to plastic straw drinking straws, and uh, we're also working with a company in San Malo that uh, is making plastic out of seaweed, so it's actually biodegradable. Uh, so it's a combination of cleaning up plastic, uh, discouraging the use of plastic, and finding alternatives to plastic. It's it's a big project for Sea Shepherd. What is your feeling about Fukushima? Well, Fukushima is something that people don't really want to talk about because... I want to talk about it. Yeah, I know. But, <laughs> but in general, in general, they don't want to talk about it because there's no solutions to it. Uh, the Japanese are trying to cover up the damage, but the damage is uh, extreme and it will continue to be extreme. Uh, radioactive uh, water is seeping into the groundwater uh, below to- Tokyo. They're dumping it into the ocean. Uh, we're seeing the effects of this in uh, fish off the coast of California and certainly in Alaska. It's a major, major uh, tragedy that's been downplayed by the world media. And uh, so, but the problem with it is that, how do you deal with it? Uh, you can't You can't really clean it up. But what it does, Harold, is uh, the similar situation happening in other places in the world. Just this last week, uh, the Diablo nuclear power plant was shut down in California. And we've been trying to get that shut down for years because it actually straddles two fault lines. But they built a nuclear reactor on a major earthquake fault line, two major earthquake fault lines. So they shut that down. How they're going to dismantle it, I don't know. But the realization is coming is that, you know, these nuclear plants can cause some very, very serious uh, consequences uh, anytime there's an uh, an accident, like Chernobyl or Fukushima. And uh, in only just one generation, really, we've had two, almost three, major nuclear accidents. And that doesn't bode well for the future of nuclear power worldwide. What do you think about French nuclear politics? I'm certainly opposed to nuclear power plants. Uh, there's, you know, and uh, but you know, here's the problem. Really, comes to it is that you've got, you've got 7.5 billion people. How do you provide energy to that? Uh, there's nuclear. There's coal fired. There's oil. There's there's windmills and everything. But the problem is our entire population, worldwide, depends on fossil fuels. Uh, you know, people think that nuclear power is clean. It isn't. It actually is very intensive use of fossil fuels because to make one uh, ounce of of uh, uranium, you need a thousand tons of pitch blend ore, which means that you have to mine it, you have to crush it, you have to manufacture it, you have to transport it. The amount of fossil fuels used in the nuclear industry alone almost exceeds that and used in oil and coal-fired generating plants. So it's not clean energy. That's a fantasy that it's clean energy. But... Uh, The problem really is too much energy consumption by too many people producing too many products which are essentially of no use use at all. Uh, We we really have to cut down on useless products. We have to find ways of stopping human population growth in a responsible manner. It's it's a kind of Malthusian uh, theory. Yes, but... What is your opinion about that? Well, it is. I mean, but the population will not grow beyond 12 12 billion. That's the limit because it'll crash before then. It just isn't. The planet simply cannot 
sustain sustain 12 billion people it's not going to happen and that's going to happen before the end of this century it's going to crash and uh, I'm absolutely convinced about that now the solution is complicated but you know what what I find really frustrating is when people say you know intelligent people say well I'm not going to have any children because well you know I'm not going to contribute to that problem but they, they represent less than three percent of the entire population the people who actually are aware enough to say that and uh, I always say there's pro people probably should have children uh, because, <laughs> you know, otherwise we're just raising generations and generations of people who have absolutely no awareness, awareness at all. In fact, I think they made a great movie about it called Idiocracy, where 500 years from now we live in a world of stupid people. But <laughs> the, the thing is, is that there, there are no easy solutions, but solutions have to be found. And I think that we also really have to concentrate on uh, lowering our levels of consumption of materials and uh, instead of third world nations trying to become first world nations, first world nations should be looking at lowering ourselves to a lower level of consumption. Are you, are you aware about uh, the so-called theory? His name is Peak Oil. You know Peak Oil? Peak Oil, yeah. yeah. What is your opinion about it? It's a theory, it's a what? Well, there, it's a finite resource. It's, it's going to crash. And right now, we're already seeing uh, utilization of fracking and uh, other technologies to extract less and less of what's available. And uh, so the problem with oil is it's a drug. And uh, our entire civilization is dependent upon that drug. We are junkies. We are oil junkies. And like junkies, we'll do anything to get it. And that means destroying the planet we live on. To get it, we're going to do it. And if that means killing people in third world nations, if it means destroying our ocean, we're going to do it because we're dependent upon that drug. I mean, look at the wars that we're fighting right now over it. By 2030, we'll be probably in a major war over the Antarctic continent because that's the last untapped reserve of not just oil, but also cobalt and, and uh, other, other coal, for instance, 200 uh, meter seams of coal going through the Trans-Antarctic Mountains. It's untouched right now, but they'll go for it. And when they do, you're going to see major uh, military uh, adventures in Antarctica. So the wars of the 20th the 21st century will be wars over resources and not just you know oil but also water we're going to have some very serious uh, conflicts over water availability so in a certain way uh, global warming help a uh, big corporation to find oil in uh, antarctica Oh yeah, well it's going to make it easier. It's making it easier to exploit oil in the uh, Arctic. It's also going to open up fisheries. It's going to open up. They, they see all of the benefits. That's what they actually say. Well, you know, you environmentalists, you see that the glass is half empty. We see it as half full. We see, uh, we see uh, global warming as something that is going to help us economically. And that might be so for a brief period of time, but it's going to destroy us ecologically. I mean, yesterday, uh, the temperature in Tehran was 165 degrees Fahrenheit. That's what, 72 degrees Celsius. I mean, who can live in, in, in that kind of a situation? You know, and uh, we're seeing evidence of global warming around us all the time, or of climate change, and yet still the major mainstream media is denying that it's a real problem. It is a real problem. It's going to be increasingly more of a problem. Do you think the public opinion would change its mind about green issues if we were able to present an ecological plan which would be economically viable? Well, which make money. And then, do you think media would help to promote this plan? Well, certainly people would embrace um, uh, ideas which are presenting alternatives that are going to make money for people. But also you have the suppression of those ideas by oil companies and other companies which uh, see these as barriers to their own particular profits. So it's uh, not that easy just to find those alternatives and promote them. Uh, I mean, there's been many things that have been put forward as alternative energies and uh, less environmentally harmful ideas, but they've been suppressed by the companies that, uh, that are actually making profits, and they feel that those is a threat to their profits. Not, uh, they are not juicy. They are just blocked by uh, the, the oil lobby. Many of them are, yes, yes. I know it's far away from uh, your subject, but I, I would like to, to have your point of view about uh, Arabi Saoudite, as we call it in, uh, in French. Saudi you know Arabia. Saudi Arabia? Saudi Arabia, what about yeah. it? Tell me, tell me, what is your point of view about this country? 
Well, I, I, it seems to me there's an incredible hypocrisy in that, for instance, the United States uh, is uh, condemning uh, Islamic uh, practices in Syria, Iran, uh, you know, and uh, very Afghanistan, but it embraces Saudi Arabia. And the only reason they do that, of course, is because for money, uh, because Saudi Arabia is an economic partner. So in, because they share the same economic views, anything is, anything is justified. But um, I believe, personally, I believe that one of the problems in our, our world today uh, are anthropocentric religions, and uh, all of them. And so I think uh, the world would be a far better place if we abolished Islam, Christianity, Judaism, and all those other religions that say that human beings are the center of creation, the center of universe, and the all-powerful divine legends that we think we are. Uh, we have to put an end to that. And uh, is that possible? I don't know. But I do know that uh, that is a route to a lot of the violence and destruction uh, on this planet. What is your point of view about Krishnamurti? Krishnamurti? I actually read uh, the life story of Krishnamurti, and I remember one time where Krishnamurti in the 1920s actually held a, a press conference where he said, look, I, there's nothing special about me. I don't have the answers. Uh, this is basically a hoax. And you know what happened? He got more followers than ever. And that's when he said, okay, whatever, I will be what you want me to be. But he realized the whole thing actually made no sense at all. There are no gurus, there are no priests, there are nobody, there's no people who have special answers. Oh, yeah, I have a question on boycott, because since you said that the, everything is about economics, and boycott is, a, is an economic weapon, because people can have an impact on the economy, uh, do you advocate um, boycott? Well, yes and no. I mean, the problem with boycotts are they're, they're very difficult to uh, organize, very expensive to organize, and um, also it's hard to stop them once they start. Uh, but uh, it is a valid economic uh, weapon. Yeah, there's no doubt about that at all. I mean, the first boycott I ever participated in was with Cesar Chavez's uh, boycott of California grapes uh, back in the, in the 1960s, which I found to be was quite effective, you know, in order to get uh, rights for the farm workers uh, in California. And uh, so Cesar Chavez did achieve quite a bit through uh, the boycotting of, uh, of grapes. And uh, so that was my, my first experience with the effectiveness of boycotts. There is an increasing number of people that have chosen to be vegetarian, flexi-vegetarian or vegan. Many of them changed their way of eating and living because of sanitarian and ethical scandals. Do you think that changing our eating habits helps to fight for saving the planet and its biodiversity? I absolutely do believe that. Uh, my ships have been vegan vessels since 2000 and vegetarian vessels since 1980 and uh, because I believe that we have to set an example that uh, we can't save the world by being part of the problem. Uh, 40% of all of the fish taken out of the ocean is fed to pigs and chickens and uh, to farm-raised salmon. When you eat a hamburger you're actually eating a fish uh, so we're literally eating the oceans alive. We're killing 65 billion animals every year uh, on factory farms around the world. Uh, We're feeding more uh, fish to, you know, for instance, to our chickens and uh, are being eaten by albatrosses and, and puffins. Uh, pigs are eating more fish than all the seals in the North Atlantic. I mean, this is just completely unnatural behavior. And I do believe that uh, the humanity can sustain itself quite uh, healthily on uh, plant-based diets. Uh, they produce, uh, use less water, produce less uh, greenhouse gases, are... Uh, less of a source of pollution than, uh, than animal products. So yeah, that we've, we very much uh, promote that. But we do it for environmental reasons. Uh, we're not, you know, there, there's many ways that people uh, promote veganism. It's ethical or for their health, uh, but we do it for environmental reasons. Do you think insects would be part of the solution? Well, we, you know, I, I, I know I've been in Africa and I've seen, it's been a long time. Uh, I mean, they eat flies on Lake Victoria. I mean, they eat grubs. I mean, that's, but I, I think we have to understand that insects serve an incredible, uh, incredibly important purpose doing what they're doing. This planet is sustained and kept healthy by bacteria, plankton, and insects. Uh, and uh, we need them doing what they're doing. Uh, the bees making sure the uh, plants are pollinated, uh, worms and ants and that aerating the waters. They're basically the custodians of the planet and we need them to, to, to do that. Um, 
I don't say that uh, that everybody in the world is going to go vegetarian or vegan, whatever. I'm just saying that it certainly is an alternative, and especially for first world nations where there really isn't a necessity to be eating steak and chickens and everything every single day. Uh, I mean, you know, it's very difficult to to go when you go to into any city to find a restaurant where you can actually get a decent meal now, but. Uh, we're finding more and more that there are becoming places where you can do that and uh, people are discovering more and more that you can sustain yourself quite healthily with a, on a plant-based diet. Do you think the delphinarium model as the Marineland, where sea mammals are kept in captivity, is going to its end? We've been working on closing down uh, dolphinariums for decades and we're making a lot of progress. And we're suing marine land now in Antibes, and by, but we're also uh, uh, working to uh, shut them down worldwide. Uh, right now, there's 65. No, excuse me. Uh, yeah, there's 65 um, orcas in captivity. Uh, 165 of them have died in captivity, and so what we're working is to uh, to get those 65 that are still there free, and are we're advocating uh, sea fans to do it. It's really a form of slavery. And it also, it's just like when, you know, they raided Africa and they killed people and then took the survivors as slaves. We're doing the same thing in Japan. We kill hundreds and hundreds of dolphins and we take the best ones and, and put them in dolphin areas to amuse people. Uh, they don't belong there. These are extremely intelligent, uh, sensitive, uh, socially complex, self-aware sentient creatures. And uh, we should give them the respect that they, they, they deserve. They're not here to do silly tricks for human, human beings' amusement. The last question. Um, have you got some questions to ask to us? Mm, what is it that you're trying to? Um, what kind of information you're trying to get across? What kind of message are you trying to get across? We just try to make people talk to each other. Mm -hmm. That's it. Well, that's certainly you know uh, encouraging dialogue on all of these issues is. Uh, Is, is important and we need more people to make the, to discuss these things. Also we need people to discuss these things in a manner that isn't so confrontational all, all, all the time. Uh, people get very polarized on their on their opinions. You know, if you have hold this bit opinion then you automatically don't like the people on that opinion. Uh, that's another problem with human beings is that we have this uh, nationalism which springs from probably primitive tribal impulses, I don't know. I know a few years ago I got an insight into this because uh, we went, there's a restaurant in the United States, there's a big one called the Medieval Times, and you go there and you have a medieval meal and you get to see knights jousting and things like that. And uh, and you're sitting there, they, you don't have any choice where they sit you. So you get to sit in the blue section, the green section, the black section, whatever. And what I observed there is that they sat us in the blue section. Within 20 minutes, everybody in the blue section hated everybody in the green section. Everybody in the green section didn't like anybody in the red section. They were cheering for their night. In other words, what we saw there was nationalism rising out of for no reason at all. Why are you French? You were born in France. Why are you American? You were born in America. You know, that's the only difference between people. And so they go crazy over colored pieces of cloth and uh, different ideologies, which basically mean absolutely nothing. All people are exactly the same. And uh, so this, this, I think, is going to, along with religion, which of course is another form of division, is um, going to be the downfall of, uh, of humanity, is all of these divisions caused by artificial things like nationalism and religion. And that basically it's all one big football game, and uh, everybody's got a team, and they're cheering on the teams, and eventually they get into fights over it, as we see all the time. Paul Watson, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>